Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1. We're beginning our verse-by-verse -verse study of this book tonight. And we're going to just dive right in and we're going to cover one verse. <laughs> we're going to cover one verse, the first verse tonight. As I contemplated how to begin this study, I believe the Lord gave a caution, a caution to share with you for myself as well. I think a lot of people approach this book wrong. I think a lot of people approach the book of Proverbs with a misconception. And I'm hoping that by the end of our study tonight, we won't make that mistake as we continue through this text. I want to read the first verse. That's going to be what we're going to study. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. That's the introduction, really, of this study. We're going to look at the Proverbs. We're going to look at the person. And we're going to look at the promise that's given concerning this. First, the Proverbs. Proverbs really balance, is balanced by the book of Psalms. We just finished our study of Psalms, and Psalms and Proverbs really balance each other out. Whereas Psalms was about worship, Proverbs is about work and walk. In, in Psalms, as we made our way through the Psalms, we found ourselves on our knees in prayer and in praise, as we make our way through Proverbs, we'll find ourselves on our feet. We'll be, we'll be thinking about how we live our daily lives. Psalms is more about devotion, and Proverbs is more about the way that we live daily. In biblical times, there were only three groups of people that taught. You had the priests that taught, you had the prophets that taught, and you had the elders or the wise. They taught. But it's important for us to keep in mind that only kings and priests had a copy of the scripture. The average uh, Israelite didn't have a copy of the scripture like we do. They, they didn't have that type of privilege. And so Proverbs would have been unique and it would have been a blessing to be able to, to take a truth and just reduce it to the ridiculous, if you will, right? To, to give a pithy, picturesque, powerful, punchy truth, right? That, that one could take and meditate on and chew on and, and understand a truth from God's perspective. Knowledge you know, the world says knowledge is power. And if we take that literally, the idea is the more knowledge that I have, the more power that I have, which is an absolute falsehood. They, they preach that, but there's no depth or truth to it because knowledge is just an accumulation of raw facts. That's what knowledge is. It's just an accumula accumulation of raw facts. It's just information. But wisdom, wisdom on the other hand, is, is being able to see people and circumstances and problems and ourselves the way that God does. That is wisdom. There's a huge, huge difference in the two. Proverbs is divided up into five sections, just, just like Psalms was. We, we'll see the Proverbs of Solomon in the beginning, and then we're going to see the words of the wise, which were other Proverbs that Solomon accumulated and, and, and consolidated and brought together. Then we're going to see Proverbs that King Hezekiah put together, most likely after Solomon's death, they were put together. And then we're going to look at some words from a man named Agur, 
or agur, however you choose to pronounce it, and then Lemuel, which some believe is Solomon himself. So we'll look into that when we get there. But Solomon, I mean, Solomon is, is the author of the majority of these Proverbs. But I think it would be important, it would be beneficial for us to take a look at this person. Because Solomon started out good, but he didn't end up well. He didn't end up well. Most believe, and I agree, that Song of Solomon was written in Solomon's youth, in his younger days. Most likely written about his first love, which that didn't last very long, as we'll see in our reading tonight. And then in his middle age, he wrote the book of Proverbs. And then in his older years, he wrote Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is a lot different than the book of Proverbs is. But it says the Proverbs. So that's what we're going to look at. We'll talk more about Proverbs and the different types and Hebrew poetry and all of that as we make our way through. But it says here, these Proverbs are of Solomon. So that's what I want us to do. If you have your Bibles, it's not going to be up there. But if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3 says... And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built under the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord the Lord, walking in the statutes of David, his father. So he loved the Lord, and he was trying to walk in the statutes, in the teachings, in, in the direction of his father, David. Only he sacrificed and burned incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it says here, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Every time I read this, I'm just amazed. God signs a blank check. And he says to Solomon, what do you want? What do you want? Now, now don't answer out loud. But, but I think it would be important for you to ponder this question. What if, what if God would say to you tonight, what do you want? Name it. Name it. I'll give it to you. This is what was happening for Solomon. Ask what you will. Ask whatever you want. Now, many of us think that would be fantastic. That would be great. But we struggle, don't we, with the joke of the genie and the three wishes. What would be those three wishes, right? We, we make these comments like, well, if I won the lottery, yes, most of us would be in trouble. So God poses this question. And this is Solomon's response. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy. According as he walked before thee, listen, in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Solomon says, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. 
I've been feeling that a lot lately. I don't know how to do this. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like that feeling. I just don't. I don't like feeling like I don't know how or what to do. I, I see some of you nodding. You're like, I, I, can, I can relate to that. We want to know. There's something in us that desires to know. We want information. We think that information is going to solve our problem. Hence, hence, knowledge is power. That's what the world believes. And I'm afraid that that doctrine has spilled over into the church. Knowledge is power. I don't know how to do this. Now, maybe Solomon felt like I feel. I, I want to know how to do this so that I don't feel like I feel by not knowing how to do what it is that I don't know how to do. Most people think they know. That's, that's part of our problem. That's a big part of our problem. We, we think we know how to do what it is that we do. We, 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 we know how to raise our kids. We, we know how to live married life. We know how to do our jobs. You know, I've heard, I've heard preachers say, I've been doing this for 34 years. I'm like, well, whoo -hoo, yay. You know, right? Trophy time, right? I, I don't know how to do this. And as much as I don't like that feeling, I really believe, as we're fixing to see, God likes that. He does. I don't like it. Obviously, Solomon didn't like it. His, he's, he's stepping into his father's shoes, which were big shoes to fill. And he's like, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. He didn't maintain that attitude. I'll just say that to you. But, but we want to know. Wasn't that the great deception in the garden? I'm just gonna kinda, I'm just gonna kinda throw a little something out there. I want you to highlight it in your mind. We're gonna, we're gonna circle back to it. But the serpent was subtle and he came to Eve and he says, hey, look, there's an easier way. There's a way around this garden walk. There's a way around having to stand in the garden and wait for God to show up and then converse with him and commune with him and fellowship with him and listen to him. There's an easier way. He says, Eve, all you have to do is take one bite. That's it. If you'll just do this one thing, you'll know good and evil. You'll be like God. And she saw that the tree looked good for food and was pleasing to the eye and desirous to make one wise. Now we're fixing to step into the wisdom book. And there's a caution. There's a caution for us. Because there's a desire in us to be wise. And we got to be careful. He says, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. Verse 8, he says, And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people now notice verse 10 the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing God was pleased God was pleased that Solomon had the attitude I don't know how but you do now here's Here's why it's important for us to understand the attributes of God, because God is all knowing. And because we know that he's all knowing, then it should encourage us to get to know God. Right? Because we're like Solomon. We don't know how. 
but he does. And because he does, I need to get to know him because he knows everything. It pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this question. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. See, some of the things that we think, well, if I, if I win the lottery, or if I had a genie that give me my three wishes, now it's easy for us, right? Because we, we, we know this story. We know what Solomon asked for, but I wonder, I really wonder how many sitting in this room, I know you can't count on me. I, I don't know about you. I'll let you speak for yourself, but how many in this room would have asked what Solomon asked. If God says, here's a blank check, here, you, you, you can spend it on one thing. I would not have asked for wisdom because on most days, I got this. <laughs> At least I think I do, right? We, we think we do. He says, behold, verse 12, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there is none like thee, be that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. So, so far, God is responding to his request, giving him more, and he's giving him two unconditional promises. I'm going to make you wise, and I'm going to grant you honor. And now he goes to a conditional promise. So this also is part of our caution as we begin this study. Right? He says, if... If thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk. Now we've just finished up Psalms where most of the Psalms were written by this man, David. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David. There's a reason we're told this in this first verse. It's laying the foundation for the entire study. And if we're not careful, we will just read across verses like this and think nothing of it. Oh yeah, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Okay, now we know who he was. Next. He says, like unto your father, as your father David did walk. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. He's like, wow, wow. Now, the chapter goes on to give us an example of this wisdom. After Solomon sacrifices, he goes back to Jerusalem. And there were two harlots who lived in the same house. And they both had children three days apart. And one night they were sleeping there in the house. There was no one else with them. And in the middle of the night, one of the women rolled over, unfortunately, upon her, her infant, and her infant died. The Bible tells us that she woke up at midnight and realized that her child was dead. And so she took her dead child and snuck over to the other woman while she was asleep and swapped her child out for the other woman's child. Went back to sleep, and the next morning, the one woman woke up to nurse her child and realized the child was dead, but then realized this is not my child and knew that the other woman had made a switch in the middle of the night. And this case made headlines. It, it was all over Jerusalem and went all the way to the Supreme Court. It went all the way before King Solomon. And so Solomon sat there on his throne and listened to the case. And the case was laid out and he repeats the case. He says, this woman says it's her child and this woman says it's her child. And he says, there's only one thing for us to do to solve this matter. Go get a DNA test. 
I mean, that's what we would do today, right? We would do a simple DNA test and we would know who, who the child belonged to, but they didn't have DNA tests. So Solomon doesn't ask for a DNA test. Solomon asks for a sword. Could you imagine the courtroom? I mean, what, what, what in the world is about to happen? So someone goes and gets the sword and starts making his way back with the sword. And the Bible says that the mother of the child's heart began to burn. There was this yearning within her. And she cries out in the middle of court and says, Oh, my Lord, no, king, no, don't divide the child. Because the king says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut the child in half and give half to this woman and half to this woman. Problem solved. Imagine the gasps in the room. What? In, has the king just flipped out? Do we need to write up articles of impeachment? You know, the, whatever that amendment is, the 25th amendment? You know, we're going to write up the 25th amendment? What's, what's wrong with the king? That sword comes out of the sheath and the real mother cries out. Her maternal instincts will not allow anything to go any further. She says, no, 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 no. Give the baby to her. Don't harm the child. The other woman says, no, no, no. Cut the child in half. See, she was grieving. She had lost her child. And her greed, her, her grief turned to greed because if she couldn't have a child, she didn't want this other woman to have one either. And instantly Solomon knew who the mother was. And he says, give the child to her. She is the mother. And that fame went everywhere. I mean, it hit the headlines. Everyone knew that Solomon had the wisdom of God within him to do judgment. Another example is given in Scripture. The Queen of Sheba travels some 1,200 miles. She hears the news of this man Solomon and the wisdom that he had. And so she brings gifts from afar and she's got her little journal out with all of her questions, right? She's got all the gotcha questions, you know, did Adam have a navel and, you know, is it pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? You know, she had all that Calvinism, Arminianism, she had it all laid out. And she comes and she asks question after question after question and he answers everyone. And then he takes her around his kingdom. And she beholds his house and she beholds the temple and the way that his servants are dressed and how they behave and how everything is run. And her spirit leaves her. She is overwhelmed and she says, the half has not been told me. They told me about what God is doing in you. I didn't believe it. And they didn't tell me half of what he's doing. In 1 Kings chapter 4, we can flip over to the next chapter. We have a description of this wisdom that God gives in verse 29. It says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart. He gave Solomon this large heart. The idea here is, is he was able to see the big picture. He, 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 wasn't, he wasn't, you know, not able to see the forest for the trees, just like with the two mothers. He was able to, to see the big picture. And he wasn't blindsided and he wasn't narrow-minded like most people were. God did this for him. Gave him largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. I don't know if you've tried to count them lately, but there's a bunch of them. And Solomon's wisdom exceeding the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Skip down to verse 32. He spake 3,000 proverbs. We have about 513 in the book that we're going to study. So he, he must just get just sum up 3,000 proverbs. And he talks about the songs that he wrote. We only have one of those written, which is the Song of Solomon. But this is a description of this man's wisdom. Solomon was successful in business, which exposed him to the world. 
Solomon was sensual in his behavior, which opened his life up to the flesh. And he was sophisticated in his beliefs. And I don't say that in a positive way. I say it in a negative way. Sophisticated in the sense that he, he understood fashion and culture and the way things were of his day. What was popular. You know, what a lot of churches today want to be like. They want to be sophisticated in their beliefs. And so they're, they're open, right? See, God gave him largeness of heart, but he became too open-minded. Oftentimes, the gifts that God gives us and the strengths that we possess because of him can become our greatest weaknesses if we're not careful. Especially if we take the attitude, just tell me what to do. I just need to know what to do. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Just, Rabbi, just, I got my notebook. Just tell me. I got this. Just, just tell me. They come and said, what must we do to do the works of God? What a presumptuous question. You must not know the God I know. Because if you knew the God I knew, you wouldn't be thinking you could do the works that he does. But that's the great deception, isn't it? You can be like God. Now, I want to turn to one other passage of scripture. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 11. Because it tells us kind of the end of Solomon's life. And, and we're told the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. Solomon was a good king. During his reign, he was the third king over the United Kingdom of Israel. And Israel was at its pinnacle in prosperity, in, in all of these areas. They had peace during his reign, or most of it, I should say. I mean, he was successful. But because he was successful in business, it opened him to the world. Because he was sensual in behavior, it opened him to the flesh. And because he was sophisticated in his belief, it opened him up to the devil himself. It says, but King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites and the Z Zidonians and the Hittites and the Parasites and all of those that just leached on to him because he was a man of power and influence and money. <laughs> of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Lord, I don't know how to do this. Give me an understanding heart so that I can discern between good and bad. Solomon had information. But what we find when we compare him to his father that is mentioned in this verse, the son of David, that it takes more, listen, it takes more, pay attention, it takes more than information. Information must be paired with intimacy. We just want the knowledge. We just want, tell me what to do. We approach this book like a self-help book full of little catchy sayings that's going to help us succeed in life. And there's a caution, I believe, in this first verse when we're reminded who authored most of these Proverbs and how he ended up and why he ended up where he ended up. It turned his heart away. Now, as I read through this, I want to just, I want to give you a little hint to the answer. Four times in these first several verses, we're told that his heart was turned away. And twice, we're going to see that he is directly compared to his father, David. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David. 
king of Israel. There's a comparison right at the beginning between these two men. One was a worshiper. He was a worshiper. But he was also wise. For Samuel chapter 18 tells us three times that David behaved himself wisely. But he's not known for his wisdom. He's not known for a large heart, a broad heart. He's not known for an understanding heart. He's known as a man after God's own heart. And there's a difference. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you that wisdom's bad. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't seek after wisdom. I'm just simply saying that wisdom is more than just information. It's more than just knowledge. It's more than just tell me how to do it and let me go. Because if I tell you how to do it and let you go, you're going to go astray. Because that's what happened to Solomon. They will turn away your heart after their gods. And it says Solomon clave unto them in love. And he had 700 wives, princes, and 300 concubines. And his wives, here it is again, turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives, here it is again, turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. Here's a comparison. As was the heart of of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord. Here's the comparison again. As did David his father. You remember when we studied the Psalms? David says, My soul followeth hard after thee. Followeth hard after thee. Verse 9 says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which appeared to him twice. We read the first appearance where he was there in Gibeon and the Lord says, In a dream, tell me what you want. The Lord appears to him again after the building of the temple. And the Lord warns him of things during that time as well. So the Lord appeared to him twice and told him, and yet his heart was turned away. What does this tell us? What does it tell me? Well, Solomon had a large heart, a largeness of heart. He had an understanding heart. Solomon's request, though the Lord was pleased with it, wasn't enough to sustain him, right? Because here was his request. I don't know how to do this. I want you to show me how. I want to know how. And the church is filled with people who just want to know how. And many believers approach this book, the whole book, but Proverbs especially. It's a self-help book. It's going to tell me how. And all I got to do is do the how and everything's going to be great. Solomon said, I want to know how. David prays in Psalm 25, I want to know you. There's a difference. There's a big, big difference as we compare these two men. I want to know how to do. And David says, I want to know you. Show me your ways. Teach me your path. Right? It's in knowing you that I know what to do. But we think we just need to know what to do. That's all we want from you. There's a big difference. Solomon says, I want an understanding heart. David says, you desire a broken heart and a contrite heart. 
right? He was angry with Solomon. But, but David says, that kind of heart you won't despise. David prays in Psalm 51, give me a clean heart. Give me a clean heart. So, so I just want to spend a few more minutes cautioning you before we jump into this study. I'm excited about this study. I'm excited about this book. But we need to understand. We need to understand the, the premise of this first verse and the foundation that it lays before us and what it tells us about who is writing this and, and the story of his life and who his father was and the difference between the two. Because listen, listen. Your most urgent need tonight is not another insight. It's not. Your most urgent need tonight is not another revelation. Now, I'm not against insights. I'm a teacher. I love insights. I'm not against revelation. I love revelations. We need revelation, but that is not your most urgent need tonight. Your most urgent need is to trust what you already believe. To trust what you already believe. We've got it backwards here in the West because this is what we think. We think that knowledge leads to belief. We gain more knowledge, therefore we gain more belief. But I'm here to tell you tonight, the church is full of people who believe. Full of people who believe, but don't know. That's Western mindset. It's backwards. It's wrong. But in, in biblical mindset, in Hebrew understanding, you go from belief to knowledge. You go from the head to the heart. Some of you are like, I ain't quite buying that. I know it's inbred within us. But that's Hebrew understanding. You go from belief to knowledge. In Hebrew understanding, unless there is a personal experience and personal evidence of something, you just have belief. It's just a theory. I'll give you an example. Don't answer out loud. But I'm going to ask this question, and I could ask it to the church across America. Here's what I would say. Do you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? And I bet 90 or 90 plus percent would shout, yes, I believe that. My next question then would be, do you read your Bible every single day? And are you in the process of reading it through from cover to cover again and again and again so that every one of those words can be substance for your very life and nourishment for your soul? And you would drop that percentage a bunch. What you have is a bunch of people who believe in a theory. They have no working knowledge of that belief. The word is yada in the Hebrew. And David, the one we're comparing with Solomon, uses it in Psalm 51. He says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know. There's the word yada. To know wisdom. This word know there is not the way we think of knowledge. It's, it's more than just the intellect. It goes beyond thinking. It, it carries over into the five senses. We understand it like this. We'll say things like, wow, she really has a feel for the game. Or 
he really has a touch on the piano, doesn't he? Or we'll say things like, wow, who designed this place? They really have great taste, right? It's, it, it's beyond intellect. It's, it's beyond what you can learn in a book. I'll give you another example. Everyone knows or believes, I shouldn't say, everyone believes that we shouldn't touch a hot stove. But some of us know we shouldn't touch a hot stove. Don't ask me how I know. I know that it's not a good idea to touch a hot stove. It's not a theory for me. I have experienced it. I have intimate knowledge of that thing. This word yada is so intimate. You read it a bunch of times like this. Adam knew Eve. It's a euphemism for sexual relations between a husband and a wife. It's a knowing. There's a knowledge. There's an experience that takes place. It's information that drops from here and it becomes very intimate here. And that's what needs to happen. And when we approach a wisdom text like this, a book, it's so easy for us to say, just tell me what to do. But it doesn't work. And Solomon is proof of that. His life is proof of that. And the church is filled with believers who say, just tell me what to do. Give me the rules, preacher, and I'll follow them. I'll follow them. Give me the little, the little formula. That's, that's all I need. Just give me the formula and let me go. This, this garden walk, it takes too much time. Sitting around waiting for God to show up and then listen to what he says and try to contemplate. Wow, have you heard him speak? Never a man spake like this man has. And, and I have to... I have to kind of chew on it. I got to, could you repeat that? Because, and oftentimes the disciples are like, Lord, explain to us the parable of, because, because they're like, what? That takes time. That takes energy and effort. And I, there's got to be a shorter way. Surely, if you just tell me the information, if you just give me, the, because knowledge is power. There's this big contrast between these two men. They were both wise, the Bible says. Obviously, yes, one was wiser than the other. One is known for his wisdom. But the other one is known for being a man after God's own heart. And maybe that explains how he was able to behave himself wisely. There's a difference in having wisdom and behaving wisely. See, there's knowledge, and then there's this is how you apply it. So we've talked a little bit about the Proverbs. We're going to go into it some more. We've talked about the person. Now I want to talk about the promise. The promise. Because this is where it gets exciting, now that we understand the little caution, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. You think, well, that's great, right? I, Great for Solomon, right? Man, lucky guy. God's never appeared to me in a dream and asked me, what do you want? Not that I probably would ask for wisdom if he did. Because I'm dumber than Solomon. But James chapter 1 says, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then he says this, if any of you, that means you and you and you and you and you and you and me and you and you and you and you back there. If any of you, not just Solomon, if any of you, James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, here's what you got to do. It's complicated. It's difficult. Ask. Just let him ask. Just let him ask. But, but see, we're in the information age. We know stuff. We love to go on Facebook and tell people what we know. 
We love to piggyback on things that people put on Facebook to show them how dumb they are and how smart we are in correcting them. And we, we know it. So I know based on the way most of us are acting, we're not asking a lot. And so in James chapter one, James says, ask, just ask. He says, let him ask of God that giveth to all men. Listen, liberally. Some of you conservatives didn't know that God was a liberal, did you? (laughs) Liberally, he just gives and gives and gives and gives. And the conservatives say, you can't just keep giving all that stuff out. But see, he doesn't ever give out. And his account is, is never withdrawn. He just gives and he's, he's got as much as he had before he gave. He gives liberally and he upbraideth not. Never once has he said, Gordon, how many times are you going to ask me this? How, how long is it going to be before you get this, son? Because I'm still asking for the same wisdom that I was asking when I was 15 years old. When I was 15 years old, I walked out of that building being born again in a whole new life, in a whole new world. And the guy that led me to Christ says, over the next five minutes, you just need to seek the Lord and try to live for him for the next five minutes. And when that five minutes is up, you just need to try to do it for another five minutes. And that's what I've been doing. But he was wrong because I can't go five minutes. So it's just like continuously I'm having to ask the Lord. I don't know how to do this. How do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? See, we make the mistake in not realizing that wisdom is a person. Wisdom is not principles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, we're told that Christ is made unto us wisdom. He is made unto us wisdom. Colossians chapter 2 says, In Him, in Christ, is hidden All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you want wisdom, there's only one place you're going to find it. And it ain't a matter of give it to me and let me go. Because you've got to do more than ask. You've got to ask and you've got to abide. See, Solomon didn't abide. He asked. God gave it to him just like he'll give to us. But he didn't know what to do with it without the Lord. You can't handle it. I can't handle it. They're hidden in him. So there's no way to bypass that garden walk, church. I don't care what tree you partake of. The only way you get it is to walk with him in the cool of every day. And you got to keep coming back and coming back and coming back. And there's no graduation That's why a lot of the things that I've been doing for a long time in the church, I'm still like, I don't know how to do this. And God is pleased. And I'm like, I don't like that. And he's, I really like that. I like that. I don't want to keep you just like that. Because that is going to keep you coming back to this garden. Because the moment I figure it out, I'm gone. You say, Gordon, don't say that. I know me. I know me. If God wrote a blank check, I'd never return. I would never return. That's the danger that we face in studying this book. Because a lot of believers just open it up and like, oh, hey, I got my little knowledge and watch me go. It don't work that way. You got to abide in it. You've got to apply it. To your life. James also says, don't just be a hearer. Don't be a hearer of the word. Don't open up Proverbs. You know, some people read a chapter every day or just a little bit and they read it like, oh, that sounds so gr- sounds so good. A soft answer turneth away wrath. But grievous words stir up anger. That just has a ring to it, don't it? That'd make a, that'd be a, that'd make a nice little Facebook post. Ba-ding! Right? Don't just be a hearer. Be a doer. Of the word, otherwise you're deceiving yourself. You say, Well, Gordon, this this Yada thing that you're talking about, it's it's in Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. It's it's an experience. It's 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 something that I have an intimate knowledge of. 
There are things about God that you will never change my mind about. Like Paul says, I am persuaded that he is able. Paul's not saying, I believe. Paul's saying, I know. I know. There's an equivalent word, not completely, but, but partially equivalent in the New Testament. It's, it's gnosko in the Greek. It's, it's a word that you'll find. I'll give you a little homework. If you want a little Bible study homework, go read the first John. And I want you to find in first John all the times that John says, and we know, and we know, and we know we've passed from death into life because, and we know that it's the last days because, and we know, and we know he over and over again, because he's fighting against a false doctrine of his day called Gnosticism. And it hasn't went anywhere. It's, it's here today. And it's this idea that salvation comes from knowledge. You gain this knowledge and that's how you're going to be saved. And we have churches filled with people with knowledge. So much so that you could take a majority of people in Christian churches in America and take them to some third world country, tribes and cultures and villages, and those people would surround you and want you to tell me, tell me, Tell me another verse. Tell me another scripture. Tell me another. Because some of these places, they have like one Bible that they share amongst the community. They, they're not like us. You know, I got like 30 or 40 or 50 Bibles. You know, I've got every kind of study Bible known to man. I've got all the, I'm, I'm surrounded by information. And I believe it all. I believe all of it. I, I believe this whole book. And you do too. But I don't know it all. And that's, that's what I need. So we would go over there and they would just surround us. They would flock to us. Oh, tell me another verse. Tell me another verse. Okay. And kind of explain to me the outline of Ephesians. And they would just be hanging on your every word. And you would think you were something. And I would too. We'd be like, Hey, hey kind of like this until worship would start. And if you had a conscience, it would break your heart and you would begin to weep when you watched and listened to the way they worship. And when it was prayer time and you would listen to those saints cry out to the God they know, the God that they rely upon for the next meal, for the next day, your conscience would smite you. My conscience would smite me because we know a bunch of stuff. They know God. And so I just caution us as we move forward. It's okay to ask for an understanding heart. But not at the expense of being a man or a woman after God's own heart. Right? In John's Gospel, chapter 2, the last few verses, it says this, that, that many people believed on him when they saw the miracles that he did. A lot of people became believers, just like that. Wow. But the next verse says, but he did not commit himself to any man, for he knew what was in man. What's interesting is that word commit in the King James is the same word as believe in the previous verse. So literally you could say many believed on him, but he did not believe in them or he did not entrust himself to them. They believed intellectually, but he did not commit himself to them relationally because there wasn't a knowing. And what's interesting is there's no chapter divisions in the original language. And so John goes straight into John chapter three and tells the story of Nicodemus, a man who believed a man who was a teacher of the law, but did not know what he needed to know. And Jesus says in Mark's gospel, take heed what you hear. Take heed what you hear. And then in Luke's gospel, chapter eight, he says, take heed how you hear. And this is what he says. I'm going to close with this. He says, for those who have shall be given more. But those who have not, even that which they seem to have, shall be taken away. 
we think we have all this stuff and we got it all figured out. And we wonder, well, why, why am I not getting anything out of my quiet time? Right? Because we don't have the attitude that we first see in Solomon. Lord, I'm reading, I, I, I'm making my way back through Deuteronomy and I don't know this book. Not like I should know it, but I want to know it. And I want to know you. I want to know you. And when I read through a text that says to forgive, I don't need to say, oh, that sounds so pretty. Isn't God good? I mean, wouldn't the world just be a wonderful place if we would just all forgive one another? And I'm harboring unforgiveness for my dad or for, you know, an ex-lover or whatever it might be, right? I'm harboring that. But I believe. I believe, man, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. So are you excited? Some of you are like, I, I, you ought to be because when God warns us of something, it's to keep us away from it. It's his love and his mercy and his grace. And, and, and if we want the benefit of wisdom, we need to know. We need an intimate knowledge. We need to trust what we already believe. So I don't know what you believe or what you say you believe. And I don't know what you know based on what you say you believe. But you really need to spend time in that garden walking with the Lord because he'll tell you what you believe versus what you know. But when it moves to knowing, when, when information moves to intimacy, your life will change.